Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about how oil companies acquire resources. The three basic ways that oil companies acquire resources. At the top, we have ground floor exploration. This is when an oil company obtains an exploration license, drills a wildcat exploration well, that's a brown well on a brand new potentially petroleum bearing structure, which may or may not find hydrocarbons. And actually, 70% of the time, 75% of the time, it doesn't find hydrocarbons. So it's a risky business, but also a potentially rewarding one. In this corner, we have mergers and acquisitions. This is when companies effectively buy reserves from other companies. There could be all sorts of reasons why companies sell, and there could be reasons why companies buy. And I'll talk about those as well. And then finally, in the uh, bottom left corner, we have discovered resource opportunities. This is similar to M&A, except an oil company gets an already discovered resource from a government and develops it in either in partnership with a state oil company or by itself, um, where they finance and execute a development of something which has already been found. So why do companies need to acquire reserves? Well, basically, the job of an oil company is to turn the reserves they have into cash by producing the oil and gas. Obviously, what that happens as a result of that is that their oil and gas reserve base depletes. And oil companies tend to have a production life on terms of reserves of about 10 or 11 years. And these are the major oil companies from ExxonMobil, Chevron, Total, Shell, BP, ENI, Equinor, and ConocoPhillips. And on average, they have a reserves life of about 11 years. That doesn't mean that they'll stop producing after 11 years because they turn resources into reserves. They make new discoveries. They buy reserves from other people in order to keep the reserves bank up. And these companies have had reserves lives of about 10 years or so for donkey's years. So basically, they've, they've kept going. Obviously, if you still wish to be in the NP business, you need to maintain this. If you wish to get out of the NP business, you can run this down. It's a matter of choice and corporate strategy but you need to feed the funnel if that's where you wish to be. So this is a picture of the funnel. You have at the entry level of the funnel a lot of exploration uh, concepts and leads. So these are the figments of a geologist's imagination that may turn into exploration prospects which are slightly more fixed views of a geologist. These will then be drilled, may turn into discoveries, may not. These can then turn into potential fields that need to be approved by government authorities in order to produce. Fields then, these fields then need to be developed, then they'll produce, and then they'll come in late life, which is towards the latter part of the field. Now, in terms of M&A, people buy and sell assets at all times. So a uh, company that may have a promising part of exploration acreage may sell some of that or farm it out to another company to fund the drilling. Companies uh, in midlife, we have a producing field, they may need the cash, they may sell a bit of equity in that field. Companies towards the latter part of the field's life may sell the field because they don't wish to uh, carry on producing from something which is coming towards the end of its life and has potentially high costs, so they may sell to a lower cost producer. Ground floor exploration covers this bit, so exploration concepts lead exploration prospects, so companies may come in on that. Discovered resource opportunities are things that have already been discovered, so things which are yet to be appraised, things that are potentially uh, close to approval, where the state oil company may need the cash or the technical expertise, or later field life where the state oil company may wish to have uh, technical input or financial input from an outsider. So ground floor exploration. It's risky business. Western IOC is only about 40% of their wells actually find oil, about 30% of those wells are commercial. Um, so, you know, it's a risky business, but the rewards can be extremely significant, it can spawn moderately large companies. So if you look at companies uh, like BG and Anadarko, both of those has subsequently been acquired. I was involved at, uh, I was with BG for a long time, um, created a great deal of value through frontier exploration, where they discovered resources, put them through the development, gain value for their shareholders. You can also urinate an awful lot of money away when you're exploring when you're going to the wrong places, and I'm not going to mention anyone for save embarrassment. Acquisition costs are generally tend to be quite low. Leases from governments, uh, you normally go through an open bidding process, or could be done with a with a with a direct deal. Uh, but we're talking in the 
in the millions, tens of millions. And your at-risk capital is also relatively low. Wells do are reasonably expensive. They go from 10 million to 150 million. Rare to have more than about 200 million uh, capital at stake. So it's a situation where you have a reasonable amount of money. You can take part in quite a lot of different ventures in order to spread your risk, potentially gain more reward. A little bit about licensing rounds or lease rounds. This is a periodic round of this by a government body, OGA UK, Norwegian Petroleum Directorate, ANP Brazil, DGH, etc. And companies bid either by a straightforward cash bid, signature bonus payable of award, or by committing to a work program, or government share, all sorts of combinations, depends on the country. The national regulator looks at the bids, and then they make a decision, who's the best bidder, and then announce an award. M&A. M&A is when you buy reserves from other companies, and you can buy at all stages of the hydrocarbon cycle. So risk tends to be lower, generally because you've already discovered the hydrocarbons, uh, obviously a bit higher for an exploration opportunity, and that's one of the main attractions. Rewards tend to be lower as well, though, uh, generally because acquisitions, particularly good ones, tend to cost quite a bit of money. Uh, the seller wants to have a premium, and uh, there have been, however, high reward examples. And at-risk capital can be quite large, particularly when you're going to the development phase where most of the money gets spent. So when you go into uh, acquisitions, you need to look at why are they selling. Could be something as straightforward as the sealer, uh, seller needs ready cash to meet financial commitments. They could wish to exit a country or a base or an area. They may have too high an exposure. If you've got an exploration-focused company, you went in 100% equity. They're going to development. That's a big risk for a small company. So they may wish to offload some of that to get some cash early. They may need a technical partner who's got more financial capability or technical capability than they already have. Uh, field could be technically commercially challenging or it may have some unpleasant surprises such as uh, lower flow rate, fluid contaminants, etc. So the only ones you really want to worry about at the bottom side where uh, you've got H and I where you've got some technical challenges with the risk. But you need to know why are they selling. So potential pitfalls doing m and got limited time to evaluate. You go into a data room for a couple of days, you have a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks or so to evaluate their situation. That's a short time for a g and evaluation when you're normally talking about weeks, months to do it properly. You've got asymmetrical knowledge, information and bias, because the seller knows everything. The buyer's knowledge is a bit limited. Now the seller is due to disclose any material facts, but is the buyer's team smart enough or alert enough to notice this and realise the importance? And ambitious managers can take a bidding into a life of its own. You've also got something called preemption rights, which is rare in America but common elsewhere, so American companies can get caught out with this occasionally, and you need government approval. So a few pitfalls that you need to make sure. Discover resource opportunities. So a DRO involves a company acquiring an undeveloped discovery from a host government financing executing its development. Risk tends to be low because you've got a producing field, a developed field, but unpleasant surprises can and do happen. Uh, rewards tend to be relatively low because the government will ensure that you will not make a massive profit, but enough to you to get by. And the cost of acquisition can be high because you're buying, uh, you know, uh, demonstrated reserves. And also your at-risk capital tends to be high because you're in a position where you're financing a lot of the development phase up front. Uh, and also, if there's any uh, reduction in reserves, that could be quite painful in terms of write-down. So to sum up, how do all companies acquire reserves? You've got mergers and acquisitions, where you're buying reserves from other people, low risk, moderately low reward, high acquisition costs, high capital at risk. Discovered resource opportunities, potentially you know low to medium technical risk, generally tends to be relatively low reward, moderate to high acquisition costs, and high capital at risk. Ground floor expiration, very high technical risk, potentially extremely high reward, relatively low cost, relatively low capital risk. So any company who needs to do their reserves, growth, will look at these things, consider them in a round, and actually do a bit of all three. Thank you very much.